Okay, so um, many thanks to the organizers for putting this on. I'm really, really excited to get to be part of this. I think that even beyond the classification program in C star algebras, a lot of research in C star algebras is getting to the point where we can learn a lot from the tools, uh, the more categorical tools and techniques that have been developed on the von Neumann side. So I'm super excited to see what comes out of this. But uh, Right, so I'm to give the first expository talk on the abstract approach to classifying C star algebras. So first I'll start with a little uh, caveat. Um, also uh, speaking for Jose, in these two expository talks, we have two 50 minute slots. Uh, our goal is really to give the participants who are not uh, working in the C-STAR classification program, just a working overview of what the program is and what its primary products are, in particular, capstone results and key ingredients. This is not meant to be a full account of the program or its history. Um, but really, we just want to prime all the participants to ask questions and discuss ideas in next week's sessions. Many times I'm going to uh, have to credit theorems to many hands as the author, which basically means that the names don't fit on one line. Um, but uh, either way, a lot of things I'm going to talk about are going to be pretty uh, light handed and broad strokes. But the idea is just to try to give you more fodder to talk about next week. And the main thing I want to work up to is this theorem that appeared in 2015. It didn't quite look like this in 2015, but uh, it says that simple separable unital nuclear Z-stable C-star algebras in the UCT class are classified by K-theory and traces. And the goal of this talk is to give you a good familiarity with what each of these terms mean, why they're in this theorem, what role they're playing, and why we say this is the classification pro theorem for C-star algebras. Okay, so let's start off very light and easy with a warm-up on um, C-star algebras and the Neumann algebras. So I like to think of C-star algebras as sort of the impressionable younger sister of von Neumann algebras. If something works well for von Neumann algebras, then C-star algebras will try it on and inevitably have to alter it. Uh, to work out a good intuition to carry us through the rest of the talk, uh, we start off, as Stuart alluded to before, um, the commutative setting. So commutative C-star algebras are continuous functions on locally compact Hausdorff spaces. The Neumann algebras, on the other hand, are measurable functions on regular Borel measure spaces. And then we try to keep this intuition even in the non-commutative setting. So C-star algebras by nature are more topological. In order to study them, we non-commutativize ideas from topology. The Neumann algebras, on the other hand, are more measure theoretic, and they do the same with measure theory and probability theory. And one of the big things to take away here is just by this very nature, C star algebras tend to be more rigid than the Neumann algebras, which sometimes is nice and sometimes it's not so nice. Uh, so let me just lay down uh, basically just some notation for some preliminary examples. I assume everyone's familiar with this. Um, so given a discrete group, all my groups will be countable and discrete. Um, it's uh, left regular unitary representation gives rise to a reduced group C star algebra and the group von Neumann algebra by just taking the star algebra generated by the image of gamma and closing it off either in norm or strong operator topology. Tying into the previous slide, when gamma is abelian, then we can actually realize these as function spaces on the Pointriagin dual of the group. And more specifically, when the group happens to be the integers, we can see this as continuous or measurable functions on the one torus. Now, this is where we see our first rigidity phenomenon, right? Because the one torus and two torus are not homeomorphic. And so consequently, the space of continuous functions on them won't be the same, but they are measure equivalent. And so the spaces of measurable functions will be the same. And so we already see a difference in the C-star and von Neumann algebras. Generalizing this idea a little bit, we have cross products. 
Uh, for the sake of not cluttering up the slide, I'm just going to give this construction for C star algebra. So we take a compact hollow star space and let's say countable discrete group acting on this space by homeomorphisms. Um, then this will induce an action on the continuous functions on the space by precomposing with homeomorphism. And then this leads to a uh, C star algebra, we, which we call the cross product C star algebra. If you're not used to working with cross products, this is really the C star algebraic analog of a semi direct product of groups. In particular, we think of it as being generated by copies of the two structures. Uh, here, instead of gamma, we think about unitaries that behave like gamma, so the copy of gamma and its left regular representation, and the uh, function algebra C of x. And it is in such a way that the action now becomes inner. It's implemented via conjugation. And you can even take these copies inside of a given representation on a tensor product of the associated Hilbert spaces. And similarly, if we start with a regular Borel probability space with a probability measure preserving action, uh, we get the cross product of a Neumann algebra. And one example that works nicely for both is the irrational rotation action of the integers on the unit circle, which yields the irrational rotation algebras, both von Neumann and C star. Okay. So now on to getting onto the main event, classification. And so I have to say, uh, George, I did definitely steal your image. And to be perfectly honest, the first time I saw it, it did not do that much for me. But the more that I've actually really started to think about classification as an abstract notion, the more it really starts to resound with you. Because the idea is we've got a class of objects that we would really like to understand. To say that you understand this class of objects, again, is already a bit arbitrary. And one benchmark for this is that we could possibly assign to it, even possibly functorially, another class of objects, uh, the smaller circle, which for some reason we feel that we understand a little bit better. Uh, maybe it's a little bit easier to delineate what the objects are. Um, but really we want to be able to come up with a nice robust correspondence between the two so that in a sense, what's happening in the smaller circle can even act as an invariant on the objects in the bigger circle. And we've already seen this happening a little bit with the commutative setting, right? Commutative C star algebras are in a uh, functorial correspondence with locally compact Hausdorff spaces. A homeomorphism on those spaces translates to an isomorphism on the C star algebras. And likewise with commutative von Neumann algebras and regular Borel measure spaces. So in order to get to the C star classification, the narrative has to go through von Neumann classification, just as what Stuart set up very nicely. Uh, and really the other thing is that C star algebraists take von Neumann classification as a benchmark for success as well. So if we're going to classify objects, very often what we want to do is stick with the basic building blocks. And for von Neumann algebras, that'll be the factors. Because we can write generic von Neumann algebras as uh, direct integrals of these guys. And for me, I'm going to stick to the story for two one factors. So two one factors, right, are going to be infinite dimensional, but admit a faithful tra normal tracial state. So some good examples that I'm going to stick with uh, for the group von Neumann algebras, these arise from looking at uh, groups whose uh, every non-trivial element has an infinite conjugacy class. And on these, we take the canonical trace. More generally, if I have a free ergodic probability measure preserving action of a group on let's say a probability space, um, then the resulting cross product will also be a 2-1 factor where the trace is given just by integrating against the probability measure. And again, in case you're not used to working with these things, uh, you should think of ergodicity as an indecomposability criteria for measurable dynamical systems. Uh, let's see. Right. And the last example that I want to touch on is taking... Uh, infinite tensor products of matrix algebras. So in this case, uh, two by two matrix algebras. 
Uh, and we can define a trace on this by taking the infinite tensor product of the normalized trace on the two by two matrices. And we can also view this instead as an infinite nested product, or sorry, infinite uh, nested sequence of uh, matrix algebras, where in this case, we embed one into the next by just taking elements and doubling them along the diagonal. Okay, so can we classify two one factors? Already, this is a lot to ask. For instance, uh, it's a big question whether or not um, the Van Neumann factors associated to the non-abelian free groups are isomorphic. So in order to come up with a reasonable classification program, we need to impose an additional smallness or well-behavedness criterion. And the first one is um, really like tangibly saying that you are somewhat close to being finite dimensional. So a separately acting von Neumann algebra is approximately finite dimensional if it is the strong operator topology closure of an increasing union of finite dimensional subalgebras. And when your von Neumann algebra is tracial, you get the term that probably a lot of us have heard more hyperfinite. And one example, the first one we saw was built to be an example of this. And it turns out for the separately acting setting, that is the unique hyperfinite to one factor due to a very classical theorem of Murray and von Neumann. And we call this two one, the hyperfinite to one factor R. And so what we have is a classification of hyperfinite to one factors. It is a classification, even though the thing in the little circle is just one object. Next smallness criterion, which Stuart alluded to, is amenability. So this is derived from the notion of amenability for groups. So a group is amenable when it admits a finitely additive left invariant probability measure on its subsets. This includes finite groups and abelian groups. It's closed under pretty much all reasonable group constructions. And importantly, it does not include non-abelian free groups. Actually, non-abelian free groups are, or at least the paradoxical decompositions that they admit are exactly what led von Neumann to define the term Mittelbarkeit, which they then coined amenability for. Uh, so there is an analogous property for von Neumann algebras. I'm not gonna define it, but I will tell you that it's more than an analogy for group von Neumann algebras. So the group von Neumann algebra is amenable exactly when the group is amenable. Notice that this means we're throwing out the uh, free group factors, which were problematic from, for us before. So this is a good smallness criteria. With the right theorems in hand and equivalent state formulations, it's easy to show that hyperfinite applies amenable, but often amenability is easier to verify. Of course, for finite dimensional and commutative von Neumann algebras, maybe not, but you know, these are examples of amenable. Um, the uh, group von Neumann algebra for amenable group is amenable. Also, if uh, you have an amenable group acting on a probability space, then the resulting cross product will be amenable and the hyperfinite to one factor as well. But um, speaking more directly to Kahn's incredibly influential work, uh, Kahn proves that a von Neumann algebra is hyperfinite if and only if it's amenable. Among many of the consequences of this, when you pair it with Murray and von Neumann's classification, the hyperfinite to one factor, we have a classification of amenable to one factors. And again, they're all just R. So some slightly more immediate consequences. First of all, um, if you take any two amenable ICC groups, then their group von Neumann algebras are the same. So really a lack of rigidity here. Um, likewise, uh, it turns out it does not matter how the integers are acting on the torus, uh, we're going to get the same cross products out of it. Work of Ornstein and Weiss following Kahn shows that uh, all free ergodic probability measure preserving actions of infinite amenable groups are also going to be orbit equivalent, where this is just a measure space isomorphism that sends orbits to orbits. Uh, 
Of course, classification goes well beyond what we saw in the 2-1 factor case. Um, all I will say about it is that the classification of amenable factors is complete and it was completed by Kahn and Hagero. And the last thing I wanna say before I leave this section is that an important factor in Kahn's work is the fact that any separately acting amenable to one factor is McDuff, which I will take as a definition right here is that it tensorially absorbs the hyperfinite to one factor. In particular, R tensorially absorbs itself or it's R stable is another way we like to put it. Okay. So now moving to C star classification. So with the striking and incredibly influential result uh, for infinite dimensional separately acting for Neumann factors, satisfying these smallness criteria, we want to ask the same for comparable C star algebras. So what are comparable C star algebras? Well, some of these terms, it's pretty easy to figure out what the right analogy is, simple, separable, infinite dimensional. But how do we cash in these smallness criteria? Well, the first one's not too hard to do, right? So a C star algebra is um, almost, finite, uh, almost finite dimensional or AF if it's the norm closure now instead of strong operator topology closure of an increasing union of finite dimensional subalgebras. And the first canonical example is the Carr algebra, which we can also think of it as um, a norm closure of an infinite tensor product. Warning though, uh, taking the uh, C star analog of a von Neumann algebra doesn't always preserve hyperfiniteness, right? Uh, the measurable functions on the interval zero one is hyperfinite. This just comes down to the fact that uh, anything in there can be approximated with linear combinations of characteristic functions, but none of those characteristic functions are going to be continuous. Uh, and in fact, the space of continuous functions on zero one has no non-trivial projections, meaning it doesn't really have any uh, non-trivial finite dimensional subalgebras. So it's not AF. Also, unlike with the von Neumann setting, um, simple AF algebras aren't all the same. Just if we took the infinite uh, tensor product of the three by three matrices, going back to work of Glim, we know that these guys are going to be distinct. But still, it turns out that AF algebras can be classified. Uh, and in this case, by their ordered K0 groups. And here we're seeing the first example of uh, non-commutative notions being brought into C star theory, uh, the operator algebraic K theory. So K0 is an ordered abelian group which captures the structure of projections in a C star algebra and its matrix amplifications. So if you haven't worked through it or it's been a while, just remember that K0 really captures the projection information of a C star algebra. And in fact, when it's unital, you can get your hands on it a little bit more. It's the growth in the group associated to the Murray von Neumann semigroup of projections. Okay. But what that means is that um, thanks to the work of Bradley and Elliot, we have a classification of AFC star algebras um, by order to billion groups. Okay, so now on to the other smallness criteria, this notion of amenability. There is a notion of amenability for C star algebras. I will also not mention it. I will say again that it's more than an analogy for group C star algebras. And instead of telling you that, I'll go into the character characterizations that you are more likely to hear a Z star algebraist use. The first being nuclearity, which is a tensorial property. So a C star algebra A is nuclear. If given any C star algebra B, uh, if you form the algebraic tensor product of A with B, uh, this is a, a star algebra. And it turns out there is in this setting a unique uh, C star norm that one can define on this uh, algebraic tensor product. And the other characterization is that A satisfies the completely positive approximation property, which means that there exist completely positive contractive or CPC maps uh, going from A into finite dimensional C star algebras and back to A so that their composition converges pointwise in norm to the identity on A. So if you're not used to working with completely positive and contractive, uh, contractive of course means norm decreasing. A map's positive if it sends positive elements to positive elements. And we say it's completely positive if this stays true under matrix amplifications. In general, um, 
Of course, we like to work with star homomorphisms, but they're not always as readily available as we would like for them to be. And completely positive maps are actually um, structurally very close to star homomorphisms in a sense. And they still preserve a lot of the structural information of C star algebras. So we're often very happy to just work with completely positive maps. Okay, just like in the von Neumann setting, uh, some examples of now we call them nuclear C star algebras are finite dimensional and commutative, um, reduced group C star algebras for amenable groups, um, crossed products by amenable groups. Also, uh, C star algebras that can be built from these via ideals, uh, tensor products, quotients, extensions, direct limits, not sub algebras. And also, I should mention that uh, the quotients is actually a very difficult result. But from these, we also get AF C star algebras, which are clearly the direct limits of finite dimensional C star algebras. Uh, much less trivial is that we get uh, the irrational rotation algebras, which can actually be seen as direct limits of uh, tensor products of commutative and finite dimensional C star algebras. And even outside of these constructions, it's possible to find uh, nuclear C star algebras, including uh, a very important class, which is the Kunz algebras. So you can see, like with von Neumann algebras, AF implies nuclearity, but unlike with von Neumann algebras, nuclearity does not imply AF. In particular, we can find examples coming from any of these, any of these examples highlighted in red. Moreover, for irrational rotation in Kunz algebras, none of these guys will be AF. Okay, so can we classify nuclear C star algebras? Well, if we want to go beyond AFC star algebras, we need a larger invariant than the ordered K0 group because AFC star algebras pretty much exhausted it. So then the natural thing to do is to add the next K group, the K1 groups. And in fact, if you stick, there's a larger class of C star algebras such that if you stay within this class, uh, then they can be distinguished by their ordered K0 groups together with the K1 groups. Uh, so what is K1? Again, if you're, if you're um, not so familiar with these, K1 is an abelian group, which now captures the structure of unitaries as opposed to projections in the C star algebra and its matrix amplifications. When A is unital, I can tell you exactly what it is. You take the uh, nested union of the unitaries in the matrix amplifications over A and just mod this out by homotopy equivalence. And that gives you the K1 group. There are higher K groups. Uh, we don't go to them because it turns out that bot periodicity tells us we cycle back as we go into higher K groups. So really, this is all the K theoretic information we're going to get. So uh, the last ingredient then is uh, traces. This is pulling much more from the uh, von Neumann setting. And when we say traces, we mean the simplex of tracial states on a C star algebra. And together we refer to all of this information as k theory and traces, just as a catch all. Okay, so now it becomes a vocabulary word. What is the class of classifiable C star algebras? And those are exactly the ones that as long as I'm staying in this class, I can distinguish two C star algebras by just knowing their k theory and traces. Okay, so what do we want? to describe the class, well, we want them to, we want to borrow some analogs from the von Neumann setting. So we want simple, we want separate reacting. We're going to stick with infinite dimensional. I'll come back to that a little more later because we really, really want to stick to infinite dimensional and also unital, but mostly because units make our lives much easier. We also want to stay in the realm of nuclear C star algebras. That's how we got here, but we don't want to go beyond nuclear. Um, turns out we can come up with a lot of counterexamples. In particular, there are uh, infinitely many simple, separable, unital, uh, non-nuclear, but exact, just beyond nuclear, C star algebras that are that K theory and traces can't distinguish uh, from the Kunz algebra O2. By the way, because I've thrown in a few of these examples, I do have to say combining simple and nuclear means we need to throw out some reduced group C star algebras. They have characters. Um, 
Also, we'll have to disregard commutative C-star algebras, but we still get to keep simple AF, irrational rotation, Kunz algebras, and cross products with a free minimal action, where minimality is the topological version of ergodicity. It's just another non-decomposability criteria. Okay, so is that it? Is that is that how we delineate the class of classifiable C-star algebras? Can we classify simple, separable, infinite dimensional, unital, nuclear C-star algebras by their Cavarian traces? No. So building on work of Villison, Rodham and Toms um, used higher dimensional topological phenomenon to construct um, C-star algebras that satisfy this list of adjectives, but still can't be distinguished by K-theory and traces. So you might think that this means that the invariant is, is off. Maybe we need more than K-theory and traces. And I want to reassure you that the K-theory and traces is right. It's the class of C-star algebras that's wrong. Uh, so to give you a feeling for this, one of the examples that Rodham constructed was a simple separable unital nuclear C-star algebra that is finite but has no traces. These constructions are very pathological for reasons that should it should encourage you to think that these need to be thrown out as opposed to us needing to expand our invariant. But how can we structurally describe a C-star algebra so as to automatically throw out these pathological issues? What is the extra structural criteria that we need? Okay, so to the end. Finite nuclear dimension are how I learned to stop worrying and love Z. Okay, so now here's the version of the classification, the classification theorem that you probably did see in 2015. So on the upper line, these are all the adjectives that we said we wanted classifiable C star algebras to satisfy. And now we say that when you take this with finite nuclear dimension, in the UCT class, these are the classifiable C-star algebras. These are the ones that are classified by their K-theory and traces. So what is finite nuclear dimension? I'm gonna leave off UCT for a little while. Trust me, I'm coming back. I promise I'm coming back. But finite nuclear dimension is a refinement of the completely positive approximation property for C-star algebras, which now incorporates a generalized notion of Lebesgue covering dimension. So again, this is pulling more inspiration from topology. And in particular, uh, the nuclear dimension for a commutative C-star algebra uh, corresponds to the Lebesgue covering dimension for the underlying space. Now, it turns out to get to the version that we saw before, if we take a C-star algebra that satisfies the first line of the classification theorem above, so simple, separable, unital, infinite, dimensional, nuclear, it has finite nuclear dimension if and only if it is stable with respect to tensoring with the jung Su algebra Z. In other words, it's uh, what we call Z-stable. So that leads us to the version of the theorem that I gave you at the beginning of the talk, simple separable unital nuclear Z-stable C-star algebras in the UCT class are classified by their K-theory and traces. And that's the class of classifiable C-star algebras. That is the classification theorem for C-star algebras. And uh, the small invariant uh, in the other corner is K-theory and traces. I should dissect this a little bit for full disclosure because I've mentioned uh, traces and I've put in parentheses with traces, but what happens if there are no traces? And it turns out that this was actually handled uh, well before, um, well, well before the more recent progress in the classification program. So Kerchberg proved that if you have a simple unital and nuclear C star algebra with no traces, then uh, it turns out that dead. Z stability implies pure infiniteness, where a C star algebra is purely infinite when every non zero hereditary uh, sub C star algebra contains a projection that's equivalent to the identity. And what this actually leads to is a complete dichotomy from the classifiable C star algebras. 
right? Especially, you know, now that we know exactly what to call classifiable sea star algebras. So on the right hand side, when they have no traces by Kirchberg's result, this means that they're going to be, this is in direct correspondence with the ones that are purely infinite. And because of this dichotomy, it turns out uh, that the ones that have traces all have to correspond to the finite ones. So, oh, why, do, why is it starting a breakout room? Okay. Um, but there we go. Good. I'm back. I don't know why breakout rooms is doing stuff. Okay. All right. Uh, right. So here we actually get a really uh, robust correspondence between uh, the classification results for C star algebras and the classification results for. Um, type 2, 1 and type 3 factors. In fact, the correspondence on the right hand side is actually very robust because a the Neumann factor is type 3 exactly when it's purely infinite as a C star algebra. And I should mention, uh, just to really clarify what Jose will talk about later on, is that um, when we talk about the new approaches to classification uh, or the abstract approach to classification, I'm really talking about the left-hand side here. What was done uh, by uh, Kedgeberg and Phillips, they handled the uh, purely infinite setting. And those techniques are not what we're describing. And this is not the, we're not giving an abstract approach to the right-hand side. It's really the left-hand side, particularly where we have traces um, that we're describing. Okay, and there we go. All right, so Z is playing such an important role. What is Z? The Jones-Su algebra is a simple, separable, unidual nuclear C star algebra which acts a lot like an infinite dimensional version of the complex numbers. In particular, it's self-absorbing. And actually it's what we call strongly self-absorbing. Uh, and this is really reminiscent of the way that the hyperfinite two one factor is self-absorbing. And moreover, Z is minimal. Um, the minimal C star, non-trivial C star algebra with this property in that it embeds into any other such C star algebra. Also, by the way, it satisfies the UCT, so it is classifiable. Okay, so moreover, Z has the same K theory and traces as C. And this, by the way, is the re one reason that we have to insist on infinite dimensional in the classification theorem, uh, because we do have an infinite dimensional C star algebra that's indistinguishable by K theory and traces from a finite dimensional one. All right. But it turns out, moreover, that any unital C star algebra has the same K theory and traces as its uh, tensorial stabilization with Z. And what that means is that we can only classify up to Z stability. So that means that Z stability is already necessary for the classification. Okay, so at this point you might want to know, okay, but really what is Z? If you want to get your hands dirty, could you build it? Yes. Uh, Z can be constructed and probably the most user-friendly version is uh, as an inductive limit of what we call dimension drop algebras. So these are um, certain sub-algebras of cones over tensor products of um, matrix algebras of prime and relatively prime dimension. Uh, the connecting maps I will just say have to be chosen very, very, very delicately. But I don't want to focus on that. We're really much more interested in Z with regards to its role in the classification program. And actually much more than Z, we're interested in the property of Z stability. So what is Z stability? So in the tracial setting, this is the C star analog to the McDuff property, which is uh, which I define to be uh, R stability. But it, it goes a little deeper than this. In fact, McDuff characterized R stability as having approximately central matrix subalgebras, and Z stability is characterized by having, let's say, suitably large approximately central matrix cones, uh, so cones over matrix algebras as subalgebras. 
in a categorical setting, we'd say that separable Z-stable C-star algebras with star homomorphisms up to approximate unitary equivalence forms a monoidal category whose unit is Z. So just to make sure that we've all seen this definition, uh, we say that a pair of star homomorphisms are approximately unitarily equivalent if there is a sequence of unitaries in the target space so that if I conjugate um, the first homomorphism by these unitaries, this converges pointwise and norm to the other. Okay, so what this also means is that if we take the class of simple separable unital nuclear C star algebras and localize them at Z, so that means tensor Z onto all of them, then this gives us the class of classifiable C star algebras. Modulo the UCT. Okay, so let's address the UCT for a slide. We also require that a classifiable C star algebra satisfies the universal coefficient theorem or UTC, UCT. There are too many letters. Essentially, this says that the K theory of a C star algebra is enough to describe its KK theory. More formally, uh, if I want to squeeze it into a couple of lines, A satisfies the UCT if and only if whenever I take another C star algebra that has trivial K theory, then KK of A with C is trivial. Or equivalently, A is KK equivalent to a commutative C star algebra, or alternatively, one could use um, type one. So what is KK? So uh, Kasparov's uh, KK is a bivariant functor on separable C star algebras that generalizes in one coordinate K homology and in the other K theory. And we think of KK equivalence as a loose notion of homotopy equivalence. But for full disclosure, this is not the picture that we work with when we work in the more uh, abstract approach to the classification program. Instead, we look at the Kunz pair picture. And here, for separable C star algebras A and B, KK of AB is an abelian group that consists of homotopy classes of pairs of star homomorphisms from A into the multiplier algebra of the stabilization of B. And these agree modulo the stabilization of B. So they agree in the corona algebra. And so what the UCT allows us to do is to state the invariant, to state the theorems in terms of K-theory. But then when we pass to the proofs, we utilize KK theory. And then what you start to see a lot in the proofs is we start to address pairs of star homomorphisms. And then we can bring in things like lifting results. But I think Jose and Chris will go into that much more than this. The other reason we tend to uh, kind of push this off to the end, aside from the technicality, is we would prefer that it's not in the statement of the theorem at all. Uh, so it's an open question whether or not every separable nuclear C star algebra satisfies the UC team. And it turns out um, we would actually be perfectly happy just knowing it for every classifiable C star algebra. That would be enough. Uh, as far as uh, counterexamples, virtually anything one can write down, the answer is yes. It does satisfy the UC team. Um, but also one more note on this before I leave the UCT slide. If you've noticed a, an uptick in interest in Carton subalgebras and C star algebras, this is because of uh, results of Barlakli and two, which say that a separable nuclear C star algebra satisfies the UCT when it admits a Carton C star subalgebra. Uh, Kristen, there is a, a, a question in the chat, which I would like to, um, from Grigoris uh, Kopsachelis. Uh, who asks, historically, how did the Jiangsu algebra first occur? What was the motive behind its first construction? Mm. So, I mean, obviously this appeared in a picture of, uh, or in a paper of Jiang and Su, but I don't remember what they gave for the original motivation. Um, does someone want to step in and say? Then perhaps maybe we could talk about this afterward in the discussion after your talk. We'll do that uh, in the first breakout room after your talk. Okay. okay. Thank you very much. 
No, I mean, the thing is, it, it has, if I were to speculate, it's got a lot of very, very, very nice properties. So I would guess that they're shooting for these. Okay. All right, so let's wrap up actually with uh, some examples of classifiable C star algebras. So classifiable C star algebras include uh, some that we've mentioned before, simple unital infinite dimensional, irrational rotation algebras, the Kunz algebras. Um, turns out that if you took those pathological examples that I mentioned before, of Rordham or Tom, if you stabilize them with Z, um, then you basically kill off all these uh, delicate pathologies and they become classifiable. Um, for group algebras, like I said, if you're looking at the reduced group C star algebra for a group, uh, for an amenable group, it's got characters, it's not going to be simple. But if it turns out that you're looking at a finitely generated nilpotent group, then an irreducible representation of this will be simple. And it turns out it will also be classifiable. Uh, finally, uh, what is really state of the art right now um, for group actions is that if we take a free minimal action of a group with local sub-exponential growth, so that means that all of its finitely generated subgroups are of sub-exponential growth, uh, and it's acting on a finite dimensional space, um, then the resulting cross product is also going to be classifiable. So this is work of many hands, and these hands are not the hands in the classification but they also just don't fit on one line. And the last bit, I warned Stuart I was going to throw him under the bus for this. So um, to quote Stuart, I'm prepared to stick my neck out and say that this should hold for all amenable groups, though that's still a long way off. So thanks.